excess, which is idolatry. When we are with Jesus Christ, it's a new life. We are to put the things of this world to death. Amen. You know why we, we often forget about God? It's because we don't put Him first. Why do, I, why do I say that? Do you know who the second man who stepped on the moon? Anyone? Do you know who the second man who flew the Atlantic Ocean by himself? Or do you know who the second man who stepped on Mount Everest? You don't, right? But you do know the first man who was on the moon, Neil Armstrong. You know the first man who flew the Atlantic by himself, Charles Lindbergh. You know the first man who was on top of Mount Everest, Edmund Hillary. We don't remember God because we don't put him first. If we put him second or third or fourth, we will forget. These things of the world are so good and so evil in distracting us. It says in Philippians, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ. God wants us to have the mind of Christ. What is the mind of Christ? The mind of Christ is always attuned to his Father. What his father wants to do. God is love. And if you would read the Desire of Ages, Sister White described how heaven works. He said, it's a circle of beneficence. God the Father gives to all his created beings through Jesus Christ all the benefits and blessings and the created beings return it through Jesus Christ, their praises to the Father. It's a circle. God gives through Jesus, we receive, we give it back through Jesus to the Father. But you know, Satan came up with another idea. He said, everything I get, I will collect and not share. So what happens? It rots. It dies. The world is emphasizing to us, you are the captain of your ship. Think of yourself first. It's always me, 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 me. But you know what? Those are, as Colossians says, are idolatry. Forget about yourself and think of things that are in heaven. Amen. You know, we could live here on earth like if we are already living in heaven. The only difference is there are difficulties. There are temptations. But you know what? God is sufficient. Did you know Sister White said, we are closer to God than when the disciples were with Jesus physically. How is that possible? Through the Holy Spirit. We could ask God anything that is for good and that is according to His will, and He will give it. The reason why we don't see miracles is because we're asking of things of, of selfish things. But you ask any missionaries, have you seen or have you resurrected someone? And they would say yes. Stories in the mission field are filled with miracles of people being resurrected, of food suddenly appearing. One missionary even said, we don't believe in miracles. We rely on them. Amen. If miracles are not happening in our lives, maybe because we're asking the wrong things and for the wrong purpose. God is waiting for His people to do His work and miracles will come. Number five. Jesus he is all over the Bible. Why do I say that? Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecies. 
Do we believe that? Amen. All in the Old Testament, they were all just pointing to Jesus Christ. But you know, in, in any relationships, there are ups and downs, right? When we don't get what we want, we get disappointed. But imagine the Israelites when they were in Egypt. Oh Jesus, oh God, you just turned the, the river into blood. Surely the Pharaoh will, will release us. No. Oh, you, you just released so many frogs. Surely the Pharaoh will release us. No. After so many plagues landing on Egypt, did their life become better or harder? What did Pharaoh do? They made them work harder. But you know, in the end, the lamb had to be sacrificed for the final victory to be attained. They had nine disappointments, but on the tenth one, they were disappointed. We may go through life being disappointed so many times, but it's the last one that comes. A lot of people will be saying, oh, you've been saying Jesus Christ is coming, but he hasn't come. It doesn't matter if you're wrong, if, if it didn't happen before. But once you're right, you're right when he does come, right? Amen. We want to be on the right side when he does happen. When Jesus Christ first came, were there a lot of people who were disappointed also? Yeah. The Pharisees were disappointed. Even the greatest prophet born of man, who was that? John the Baptist. What did he say? Is, is he the one or is, are we going to wait for another? Even Peter was disappointed. You, you, you are, you're not going to go to Israel to die. But you know what? Who was Peter repeating? He's repeating Satan. That's why Jesus Christ said, get thee behind me. Because all through Jesus' life, Satan was saying, you don't have to die, Jesus. Just bow down and I'll give you everything you want. But it's better to be disappointed 9 out of 10. But if you will be getting the last one, the most important thing, then that everything will be worth it. Were the people in 1843, 1844 also disappointed? The great disappointment. But you know what? Look at the sanctuary and you won't be disappointed. Stephen Moore from Prophecies Unsealed he has this sermon, and if you would like to listen to it, it will be a blessing. It's, the title is Catching Up to Jesus. We are always behind. The, the Israelites were waiting for a different kind of leader, but they got Moses. The Pharisees were waiting for a different kind of, Jesus, of Messiah, but they were disappointed. 1844 came, they, they were disappointed. Why? Because they did not study the sanctuary as God laid it up. What did God say? Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. If we know what Jesus Christ is doing now, then we will be doing the work of repentance, of following His will, even now. Because when He does come, when probation closes, before you could still catch up to Jesus, but when probation closes, there's no more. So that's why it's so important for us, having all the lessons and, and the Bible revelation that God's given us to hold on to, this, to His world, to His Word. You know that all the great prophets and, and saints in the Bible, if we are in heaven, will be asking of us of this very same time that we are living in. We will be asking probably, oh David, how did you uh, take care of, uh, of Goliath? 
Or we could probably ask, uh, or uh, uh, Solomon, how, how, how is the temple then? How were you able to do it? But you know what? They would be coming to us in heaven and asking, how did you go through with the great tribulation? Amen. Isn't that amazing? We will have stories to tell and share with each other. Let us hold to the faith so that we could go through it as God wants us to go through. Number six, He wants to save us. Saves us in sin or from our sin? From our sin. From our sin. 1 John 5.13 says, This things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Like the shepherd who looks for his sheep, like the father that looks for his son, like the man who gives his life for his friend, he wants to give us eternal life. You have eternal life when you know and believe it. You want revival in our midst, in our church? We can have revival when we study the Bible and we are convicted of our sins. Amen. How did the disciples came about preaching with great power after Pentecost? Because they came together and they came in one accord. Probably that was the time when before Jesus Christ died, what were the disciples saying? I'm going to be first. I'm going to sit beside Jesus Christ. But after Jesus Christ died, no one wanted to be first. Everybody wanted to serve like Jesus. There is always two components in the revival. The study of the Word of God, as in before Moses came, before Jesus came, who studied the Bible to find out where Jesus Christ was going to be born? Where and when? The wise men, right? There is the study of the Bible that is the foundation of any revival. So I praise and thank God that I saw earlier that you have small groups. Hold on to the Word of God. Continually study it. And because one component is the study of the Bible, the other one is the time that we are living now. Did Jesus Christ come at the right time? Yes, yes as prophesied. And we are living in the last days. As prophesied. Amen. We are living. Everything is being fulfilled. Amen. Isn't it just a couple of years ago when even some Adventists or some even leaders in our church. No, there, there can't be a, a union between church and state. The Protestants won't give up uh, their belief in righteousness by faith. They won't link up with the mother church. But what do we see now? It's happening before our very eyes. Oh, we won't lose our freedom. The bedrock of our constitution is our freedom to express ourselves, freedom of religion. But what is happening now? You know, we should pray for our leaders. Because there are also people like us that need salvation. But if we will pay attention to just them, then we will be lost. We have to pay attention to the plan of Jesus Christ. Because when we follow His plan, then everything will happen according to His will. Perilous times will come. False prophets will come. Man's heart will wax cold. Number seven, He wants to cleanse and live in us. 
In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20, it says, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. In Romans 12, 1, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living, living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. We have been redeemed. Our body is not ours. If God had allowed Satan to, to have his way, we wouldn't have even existed. But because he loves us so much, he paid the price through his son, Jesus Christ. One doctor told me, you, you've heard of the disease uh, rabies, right? If you get rabies, do you think you'll survive? No. But this doctor friend of mine said, there is only one recorded account of a person surviving rabies. But that person, even though he survived, is not the same person anymore. When Jesus Christ gave up his life for us. The reason why he had to leave and have the Holy Spirit amongst us is why? Can he be everywhere as he was before? Not anymore. He is in heaven, but the Holy Spirit is with us. Jesus Christ, when he died and was resurrected, has been changed forever for us and he is asking us a simple thing that we accept this gift so that we could also be changed forever Amen. is that a bad exchange my life for his life a life of holiness godliness that he has and then he willingly gave it to us so when we say holiness, it encompasses everything. The things we do, we watch, even we sing about, the things we eat. It is to give glory to God. There are some in church, I mean, I've been to several churches already, and even though we, we believe in a lot of the doctrines we have. But you know where the rubber meets the road? In simple things. Right. Oh, don't sing that. Oh, don't wear that. Oh, don't eat that. And it becomes difficult when, because we in, in the church, it's like you have a newly baptized person. Compare that with somebody who's been in the church a long time. And that person who's been in the church a long time would like to lecture somebody who, who just got baptized. Oh, this is what you do. This is what you do. And the person gets discouraged and just not come back. We should always have that spirit of love inside the church. That even though our brethren are found in fault, we should be who are spiritual. Should lift them up. Lest we fall. We have to be very careful. And I've experienced that also in church when I made a mistake and that person is gone forever. We are in a church where God is the teacher, and we are of different grade levels in our spiritual walk. Some, is in grade, some are in grade one, some are grade six, or some have postgraduate degrees in, in their spiritual walk. But those who are higher should be more humble. And those who are new should be willing to accept what God has revealed. Somebody preached in our church and said, people don't leave church because of different, different doctrines. They leave church because they don't agree with someone in church. They don't like someone in church. Isn't that true? Yes. How they were treated? Yes. Right? So if we really have Jesus Christ, then we should be like Him. That even the lowest supposedly people are not turned away.
let me just read this. I know we're taking a while. I'm just going to read this from Sister White, Faith I Live By. Our first duty toward God and our fellow being is that of self-development. Every faculty which the Creator has endowed us should be cultivated to the highest degree of perfection, that we may be able to do the greatest amount of good of which we are capable. Hence, that time is spent to good account that which is used in the establishment and preservation of physical and mental health. We cannot afford to dwarf or cripple any function of body or mind. As surely as we do this, we must suffer the consequence. God is liberal in reaching out. He accepts everyone who believes in Him. But when you do, He's conservative. I want you to follow this so that you won't stray. I give you messages about health so that you won't have to suffer while you're serving me. You won't be debilitated by diseases. I want you to concentrate on my, on my Bible and the spirit of prophecy so that you won't be easily taken by the world. And I struggle with that sometimes when, when I look at Facebook. There's so many things that could distract me. Let's have that mind of Christ. Amen. It's not easy. But God has shown us how to do it. Spending time with Him, always thinking about Him first, and then take every opportunity when you meet someone to share God's love. Always every morning we should ask, God, how do you want to use me for your work? Number eight, He wants us to follow in His footsteps. What happened after Jesus Christ talked to the woman in the world? The woman went back and told the whole town. And the whole town was converted. Listen to Jesus and Jesus had to stay there for a couple of days. Jesus wants to follow, he wants us to follow in his footsteps. In Matthew 16, 24, he said, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You can't just follow Jesus Christ when you're still dragging so many stuff. Deny yourself. Carry the cross and follow. Everything that is of self must be denied. Don't reverse it. Don't follow first, carry the cross, and then I'll deny myself later. No. The thief on the cross, the good thief who repented, actually knew Jesus Christ. That's from the spirit of prophecy. He knew of Jesus Christ, but he got discouraged, so he did not follow. The denial did come first. That's why he wasn't able to follow. Thank God that he accepted Jesus Christ again. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, have you heard about him? He is a German theologian and pastor. He was considered the greatest Lutheran theologian ever uh, since Martin Luther. And he lived during the time of Hitler. And he could have had the opportunity to leave Germany and be in the safety of the United States. But he didn't leave. He stayed in Germany while Hitler was ruling, and he opposed him. And eventually he was killed. But you know what he said? He said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Come and die. We may not die immediately, but God is asking of us to deny ourselves every day. As Paul said, I die daily. John 21, 25. And there are also other things that Jesus did. If they should be written, everyone, I suppose, that even the world itself could not contain. God has so much to share with us. He wants us to share this to the world. We are the best witness for God. He could have sent angels, but He wants us to be the, a part of the salvation process. Because when we go to heaven, we could 
honestly tell Jesus, Jesus, I have fallen. Amen. Amen. He wants, if you know, did Jesus Christ write any books? No. What was the only thing he wrote? He only wrote the commandments. And he wrote in the sense. Isn't it good that he will write his laws into our hearts? But our sins are something written in the sand that could easily be removed. He wants us to follow in his footsteps. To have the law live in our life. So that even though Jesus Christ couldn't go into all the worlds himself, he is allowing us to go all over the world for him. John 13, 14-15 If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. What did Jesus Christ do before he died? Did he run away? Did he just stop doing what he was doing before and said, uh, I'll just go and die in Jerusalem? No. He still did the teaching and the healing ministry that he has always had. Isn't it true what Sister White said? Jesus healed more than he preached. So that is the work that we are going to do. Alleviate people's burdens and their sicknesses. I pray that we can say the same thing that Jesus Christ said in John 17, 4. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Number nine. He is interceding for us. 1 Timothy 2, 5 says, For there is one Lord and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. In, the, in Hebrews 2.18 it says, In that he himself has suffered, suffered, being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Sister White said in Youth in Structure, September 22, 1892, We have access to God through the merits of the name of Christ. And God invites us to bring to him our trials and temptations, for he understands them all. He would not have us pour out our woes to human ears. Through the blood of Christ, we may come to the throne of grace and find grace to help in time of need. We may come with assurance saying, My acceptance is in the Beloved, for through Him we have both access by one Spirit unto the Father, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of Him. We have the greatest intercessor. Whatever we ask of the Father through Jesus Christ, He will give. He will mediate for us all our needs. I can only testify in my own life that when I needed God, when I prayed sincerely, He has answered. I pray that it is also in your own life that whatever we ask according to His will, He will give it. And the most important thing right now that we should be asking God is, God, show me anything that is separating me from you. Any sins in my life that is an obstacle to me being with you. I'm trying to remember that song. Anyway, maybe I'll remember it later. God will ask us, even though God has given us the greatest gift, what have we done with the life that he has given us? May our lives be the life that Jesus Christ wants us to live. In Revelation 14, 7, it says, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of judgment has come. Is the plan of salvation simply God wanting us to be saved? Is that all that 
is the purpose for the plan of salvation? If that was the purpose, then when Jesus Christ died on the cross, then it would have been over. The process of salvation is still continuing because God is also being tried. You know why? Because God is being asked, is He righteous? Is He just in bringing the saints to heaven? Because if He is just, then He would have already have a people that will go to heaven and will not sin anymore. Eternity is at stake. God, we're putting God with the whole creation watching. Is it really God who is saying the truth that he will end sin? Or is it Satan saying, no, sin will continue to all this world? And when the coming of the remnant church, of a people having the patience of the saints, having the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. Because God prophesied that the same way that God prophesied that Israel will come out of Egypt, that Jesus Christ will come, God prophesied that there will be a people in the last days who will keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. God is waiting. But God will not wait forever. We are being called to be His people who will be ready to go through the Great Tribulation. Because in Isaiah 55, 11, it says, it, God's Word will not return to Him void. God is being tried if we could trust Him that sin will not come back anymore. But with the coming of His people in the last day, God will be proven right forever. Number 10, and the last one, He is coming back for us. John 14, 1 to 3. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Does the groom not come for his bride? Does the farmer leave his harvest? To just die in the field? Does the shepherd not return his sheep to the fold? Does the father not welcome back his son if he comes home? Jesus Christ gave his last promise. And what is that? I will come back. In all the promises that he gave which were all fulfilled, we have this advent hope that He is coming back. And so, I present to you today the things that I know of Jesus. And I pray that you will also share the things that you know of Jesus so that others will finally see what the world is waiting for. A people who claims and lives the way that they claim to be the children of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Lord, Father in heaven, we pray and thank you for your blessing. Thank you for your love. We thank you for the things that you have revealed to us, Lord. For we know these are all from you. Human minds cannot fathom them. They cannot understand them. But through your Holy Spirit, we are convicted. We are led to deny ourselves, carry the cross, and follow you. May it be so, Lord, now until you come in Christ's name. Amen.